Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're gonna keep working on our DNA toolkit. And we're gonna add two more functions to it. But before we do that, let's go back to our previous lesson. Let me switch to the code editor. So here are the four functions we wrote so far. They actually are collapsed. I think this is called folding markers. So if you use VS Code or any other code editor, you should be able to kind of collapse your functions like that or any other code. Okay, so Here's this function, reverse complement, we wrote last time, and it did calculate reverse complement correctly, but the output was ambiguous. Thanks a lot for community members for bringing this up. I have left the explanation and the proper solution, proper output in the YouTube comment section and in our community chat as well. So if I'm gonna go back to my main.py here and run it again. So before we did not have this part here we were using reverse complement and we were marking it as three prime to five prime end, which it is incorrect and ambiguous. So this is now a correct output. Again, thanks a lot for community involvement. This is really great and this is definitely needed. Okay, so now let's go back to our code. One more thing I wanted to add, if I go back to our DNA toolkit here, this is the way we wrote it last time. And we of course are using our structures and we use our dictionary. So this is a very generic approach. It's not really Pythonic approach. You can probably see this section here. We're gonna come back to it in a second. But if we're gonna do it this way and we're gonna use our dictionary, this is very translatable to any other language. So you might be learning bioinformatics, but you're using R or Julia or C or C Sharp or Java, whatever you are using, you can kind of read this code and implement it in any other language. And of course, again, we're using a dictionary here and we're using a list comprehension, which can be rewritten in a generic for loop. And of course, reverse as well. Most of the languages will have a reverse functionality built in too. But what we can do, if we're gonna comment this out now, we can use this, it is labeled Pythonic approach, a little bit faster solution. I'll come back to faster part a bit later. So this is very specific to Python. It has this make trans function. Of course, you can point at it and it will give you the explanation. I really encourage you to have one solution first, make sure your algorithm works and then go back and see how you can optimize it specifically for your language. Because if you're gonna use, let's say two, three, four, five different loops, a lot of if statements, if else conditions, it might work, but when you apply a lot of data to it, uh, it will be very slow. We are definitely going to look into optimizing some uh, algorithms in the future. For now, we didn't really write anything very complex or very slow, but in the future, we're definitely gonna take a look at that. But here, of course, you can create a mapping and you say, I wanna map ATCG onto TAGC. It is basically exactly the same code as we wrote here. So why is this code Pythonic? First of all, we are not using a dictionary here. We're using built-in make trans, make translation function, as if Python was kind of created for bioinformatics. It has all these amazing functions. We don't have to write most of them. So we have count, we have replace functionality, we have make translation functionality. It's great. But this is not very translatable to any other language, at least not the language I know. So if you know the language that has like make translation function in it, it's great. So it's kind of translatable, but it is very Pythonic, Python specific. So we're doing exactly the same thing. We're translating it here and we're just returning a reverse part here too. Again, it's up to you which one you want to use. So if you're just starting to learn Python, I guess the easier solution is better. So you understand you have your algorithms functions up and running. And then as you learn Python, you can come back to them and kind of optimize them. We are going to look into that as well. We're gonna write an algorithm full of loops and if else statements, and then we're gonna go and optimize it for a very Pythonic uh, code. So this is it for this part. Let's go back and implement our two new functions. So today we're going to implement GC content calculation function. Let me go to the browser now. So let's implement this GC content calculation function and then come back to it and discuss where can it be useful? Where can it be used? Let's go back to our code editor and I'm going to copy and paste the first snippet I have here. So it is still very simple Python code. We're still using built-in Python functionality. We're not writing any algorithms here. 
So I'm going to keep these functions collapsed so they're not getting in our way like that. So we're going to focus just on what we wrote today. Okay. So again, we have a sequence DNA, RNA, and we count C's and G's using a built-in method count on a string. Then, of course, we divide it by a length and multiply it by 100 to get a percentage. So let's go back to our main and add one more output. Okay. So this is going to be step number five. Let's try running it now. And of course, here's our output. It is 42. There are a lot of bioinformatics tools available online. So sometimes when you write your code, it is a good idea to use one of those tools and see if your code is giving you a correct output. Let's say GC content is 52%. Let's copy this string and let's go back to our browser and try finding a GC content tool online, okay? Okay, let's just click on the first one and paste our string right here and click calculate. It is 52%. Okay, so our tool works as we kind of tested with other tools available online. Okay, let's go back to our code editor. So as we can see, GC content is a very simple function. There are some cases where you need to look for GC content or any other content for that matter in a subsection of DNA and RNA. Someone gives you a very long string and you just want to search for some data in particular part of that DNA, not the whole genome. For this, we should implement a GC content with subsection, subset, search. So let me copy and paste my snippet here. Okay, here's our second function. Let's collapse the first one so it's not confusing us. So here we're doing almost the same thing. We have our sequence and we have a window of 20 set by default, but you can of course pass a K to that function. We're gonna define a list, an empty list here, and we're going to use a for loop to start at zero position of this sequence and up to the length of that sequence minus the K. Okay, you will see when we're going to go step by step through this code and the jumps will be the size of the window as well. Then we use our function we defined above to calculate the subseq. So this function is looping through the sequence in a specific window size and is calling this function to calculate the GC content in this specific window that we create here. Then the list is populated with values and then it is returned. All right, so let's run this code. Let's go back to main.py and I'm gonna add another output to this, which is going to be number six. Let's try running it. And here we are passing by the way our string and we are overriding the K window size five. Okay, so we have one extra output here, which is number six, GC content in subsection of K five. So you can see there are 10 values. If we take the length of our string, which is 50, and divide it by 5, we have 10 windows of size 5. Okay, how about we go to our debugger and try running this code step by step so we can see what is happening. If you understand how debugger works or you understand how this function works, it's great. If you don't, let's try looking at it right now. So I'm going to put a breakpoint right here and hit a 5 in my code editor and choose a file Python file. Let me change the size of the window a little bit here so we can actually see what is happening. So we have a breakpoint on this line here. We can see it stopped at number five and it didn't execute number six. Now we can go step by step. So we're going to get into that function and we can see we're calling this. So we are interested in looking into this variable because it will store a window and list res, which will store the calculation that is returned by GC content here. So let's try running it once now. So we can see that this function received sequence and here is that sequence and the window size is five. So we're going to go 10 times by five here. And we're gonna see it here. Let's open this up. These two structures are still empty because we didn't run them. So now we're gonna see the subseq result. So the first subseq is five letters, T-A-T-C-G, T-A-T-C-G. We're going to calculate a GC content in this subsection, which is five. 
let's do that. And now we have our first result, it's 40%. And we store it in result. Now we're gonna go to our next subseq. Let me make this smaller. So now we can see the subseq right here is next five characters from GG. So G, G, T, T, A, correct? So first five, second five, third five, and we're passing these small chunks, which are five length to this GC content count function. We can actually see what's in it right now as well by just pointing at it. Let's try running our calculation function again. And the next result is 40 as well. And we're gonna keep going through this sequence and populating this list with the results. I hope this is much clearer when you can actually see what is happening. So let's actually run through this very quickly. We're counting here, we're returning number, we're adding it to the list. We're getting next subsection, which is T, G, 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 G. We're counting the GC content in it. Right here, we're returning it, adding it to a list. And we can see our list is growing. Just like that. And then we end up with 10 values in our list. Okay, so let's go back to our code. So debugging is very useful. We're going to see that when we write much more complex algorithms. I'm going to link a video from Corey Schaefer where he shows you how debugger works so we don't have to waste our time doing it here. Okay, so now we have two functions. We've tested them as well. And let's run it again so we can see the total output of all six functions. Here they are. Let's go back to our browser. I'm very interested to hear from people with biology background. Could you please share your experience and some real life examples? Where have you used GC content? I can see it's very useful for some statistical analysis. I personally use a variation of GC content to calculate a replication origin. Here's the graph I made. It's a replication origin graph for E. coli genome. So it actually happens right here. That's where the replication begins. We are going to discuss this as well in the future. We're going to apply all our functions. We're going to modify some of them. We're going to combine some of them. And we're going to plot the results like that in our future videos. So if you're a biology person and you have some good examples of where you use GC content in your research, it would be really good if you can leave some comments in YouTube section or in our community chat. Okay, so this is it for today. Let's go back to our code editor quickly and look at the functions we wrote today. So here are two more functions and as we can see our DNA toolkit is quickly growing. So in our future videos we're going to add a couple more functions and then we're going to work on our bio sequence class. So this class is going to describe a sequence which will be DNA, RNA or protein and we will be able to apply all of these functions to any of those sequences. But again that's what we're going to work in our next videos. So this code as always is going to be available on our GitLab repository. Some of the code might not match because I'm constantly modifying it and fixing some small errors and bugs, but the structure of the code will be exactly the same as in our video. Before we close today, I want to recommend one very interesting podcast. Talk Python to me is a great podcast website. Episode 227 specifically might be interesting for our community, maintainable data science tips for non-developers. You can listen to this podcast on all the popular platforms, or if you like RSS, you can subscribe to the feed and get the latest podcasts as well, or you just download an mp3 file, and it is definitely recommended. Okay, so this is it for this video. I really want to thank members of our community for suggesting corrections on our videos. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below or pop in into one of our chats. Our community is definitely growing almost every single day. Until next time, Rebel Coder signing out.